Isley Field Saipan on the night of 27th November as B-29s load up for a strike on Tokyo. But Jap fighters attacked the great super fortress base shortly after midnight, temporarily interrupting the mission and damaging and destroying some of the giant planes. The raid, whose aftermath is recorded by these Air Corps films, lasted several minutes. Daylight reveals the extent of the damage. The effects of the strike included casualties among the personnel. Bulldozers helped smother flames by heaping earth onto the wreckage. Many B-29s were already loaded with bombs intended for Tokyo. In one instance, strafing started a gasoline fire which set off bombs in the bomb bay, the resulting concussion affecting the other B-29s parked close by. Twelve hours later, the Japs stage a second attack, using from 15 to 20 planes. Anti-aircraft downed seven of the attacking planes. Our fighters accounted for six more in running battles extending to Iwo Jima, which is believed to be the staging area for the two attacks. On the field, the raid left several destroyed or damaged B-29s. Damage was also done to three B-24s. This raid was Japan's first answer to the opening of our aerial offensive against the enemy's mainland. At a Red Cross Center, Navy films show home fronters with type O blood in their veins contributing to the first consignment of whole blood to fly the Pacific. A portable refrigerator for keeping live blood alive. Refrigerators reach Oakland, where planes of the Naval Air Transport Service operate a daily shuttle for the Navy's new organized whole blood program. Planes wing westward to serve as Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. First stop on the trip of more than 6,500 miles is Pearl Harbor. Thanks to air transportation, refrigeration, and a preservative solution, whole blood in quantities can now supplement plasma in tropical temperatures. So effective is this development that blood retains 75% of its normal efficiency 21 days after it's drawn from the donor. Westward to Guam, central point for the distribution of blood to various fronts. Blood reaches Guam 45 hours after leaving donors in California. The cargo of whole blood is kept at a temperature of between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The refrigerators are made of plywood, aluminum, and lightweight insulation material. At the base hospital, blood is taken from the central blood bank refrigerator for Navy and Army distribution. Whole blood, as distinguished from plasma, is required in many of the more serious cases. While plasma may save a man during the initial shock period, it fails when too great a loss of blood reduces oxygen in the system below a critical point. With the air transportation of whole blood, volunteer soldiers need no longer be the sole donors. To the westernmost of our Pacific ground operations, the Philippine Islands. Total time from San Francisco, less than four days. On 22nd November 1944, the first consignment arrives at Tacloban, capital of Leyte. The time from San Francisco has since been cut by 24 hours. 300 pints of whole blood a day is the goal for the Pacific. This is in addition to the 100,000 pints of plasma and whole blood already required weekly from the home front. Refrigerators can maintain the proper temperature for over 60 hours. On Leyte, one of our wounded receives California's contribution, establishing a milestone in medical history. To speed the flow of materiel southward as Allied units hammer the retreating Japs, a heavy-duty bridge across the Irrawaddy River is needed. Here at Lekapani near Lido and Assam, equipage for a 25-ton ponton bridge ends its long journey by rail from India. Shifted to semi-trailers and bound for the distant river crossing at Michinaw, the equipage rolls down the Lido Road. By 
a railroad and truck, over dirt road and marshland causeway. The bridging equipment is expedited by every practical means. On the hairpin curves of the Lido Road and the mountains between Warazup and Kamang, the semi-trailers run into trouble here because of their overall length of 53 feet. Transportation is delayed two weeks as the curves are widened. Despite this, some of the trailers shaved the embankments, damaging a few pontons. Mogong, where a 30-mile stretch of track connects with Michinaw. Here, the ponton equipage is transferred back to flat cars for the last lap of the journey. Riding along, too, are newly trained Chinese troops moving up to the Salween front. Early in December, the bridge construction equipment reaches the end of the line, Michinaw. An engineer light ponton company assigned to the project hauls the pontons to the bridge site on the banks of the Irrawaddy. Construction by parts is the method chosen for the Irrawaddy span. While the bridge is begun with the formal method of construction by successive pontons, four boat three bay parts are assembled at other points on the near shore and maneuvered into position. Routes of communication in the rugged terrain of North Burma continue of strategic importance in the Allied drive to route the Japs above Mandalay. While the advance elements, such as the specialized American combat troops known as the Mars Task Force, are frequently supplied by parachute, heavy equipment must go overland by a truck and pack mule. This heavy-duty ponton bridge near Michinaw is the first major span over the Irrawaddy, regarded as a highway through the center of Burma. Over the new bridge will go construction equipment for roads and airstrips, as well as armored vehicles in force. Completed Ponton Bridge. Although its normal capacity is 25 tons, it may be reinforced to accommodate tank loads up to 35 or 40 tons. Chinese infantrymen cross, en route to the front. South of Michinaw on 7th December, the Mohawk River is forded by elements of a tank group. They are proceeding down the unfinished Lido Road to assist in the reduction of the besieged Jap stronghold at Bamo. Arriving there on 16th December, the tank group is one day too late to take part in the kill. War dogs behind Jap lines on 4th December. As part of the Mars Task Force, which has taken over the infiltrating tactics of Merrill's marauders, a Yank battalion drives southwest from Balmo. Four members of the India-Burma War Dogs Detachment scout jungle trails. Each dog works with the same soldier at all times. Handlers prepare the food for their own dogs. Meanwhile, another American battalion bypasses encircled Balmo to strike southwest. As British, Chinese, and Americans drive southward, they come closer and closer to a solid juncture with the old Burma Road supply line to China. From Michinaw, the battalion has marched more than 200 miles in 14 days. An incident of the trail. Mule skinners coax their charge out of a stream near Shuegu. Woven bamboo mats are used to repair the bridge. During mid-December, this Mars task force element was closer to Mandalay than any other Allied unit in Burma. Chinese civilian evacuees and soldiers jam-packed the only road leading west from Liuzhou. Resting for a brief interval, these Chinese flee advancing Japanese driving northwestward along the Guangxi Guizhou Railroad in south central China. Like Guilin and other 14th Air Force bases running south from Hubei province, Liuzhou was only a short stopover place for many Chinese. They began their wanderings with the initial phase of the Japanese offensive in the north, late May 1944. The long trek continues. At this point, advanced units of an estimated 250,000 Japanese troops are but a few miles behind. Their apparent objective, Guizhou province and the provisional capital of Chongqing.
Chinese armored units retreat to more favorable positions. With them go American vehicles, some of which bear U.S. liaison units, road demolition crews, and transportation units removing the last supplies from danger areas. The route north becomes a one-way stream of mass evacuation, increasing in volume as weary refugees leave one village after another deserted and destroyed. First Army Front, 11th December. The German towns of Obergeich and Geich are in flames as Lieutenant General Courtney Hodges' forces continue the advance which preceded the German counteroffensive. The drive from village to village is across muddy plains, typical of the entire sector. Geich is less than three miles from Duren, southern citadel of the German line on the Ruhr River. In front of this drive by the 3rd Armored Division, all German civilians had been evacuated. At another point, wounded prisoners are carried to the rear by fellow captives. Beginning 16th December, a regrouping of forces takes place in this area as the Germans throw in new divisions to relieve the pressure of our attacks on the Cologne Plain. To the south, the Third Army had established a bridgehead across the Tsar at Gillingen, Germany. At a position overlooking the city, an artillery crew on 8th December is firing on Siegfried fortifications which delay movement of supplies across the river to forward units. The tension is lifted when the observer jestingly registers doubt as to the accuracy of the crew's aim. The observer's doubts reach the point of friendly wagers on each round fire. The commander covers the bets for his crew. A direct hit. The crew's bullseye sighting is acknowledged. Southward along the 450-mile front, the 7th Army was moving out of the Vosges passes toward the towns of Selestar and Colmar. This is Selestar, cleared of enemy troops on 5th December after three and a half days of bitter fighting on the Alsatian Plain. 25 miles northeast of Selestar, American artillery emplaced on the west bank of the Rhine at Strasbourg fires across the river into Kale, Germany. The bridge connecting the two cities was blown up by the Nazis a few days before this attack of 12th December. the offensive at Strasbourg continued, General Patch's forces also were active at the northern end of the salient, being driven toward the Reich border in the area around the forest of Agno. The town of Niederbrunn, seven miles south of the frontier, is cleared of last snipers by infantry troops. The infantry conducts a house-by-house -house search for hidden Nazis. Even as the 7th Army units completed the cleanup at Niederbrunn, other forces were driving toward the outskirts of Agno. On 10th December, a sudden move to the east in the area south of the town took the Germans by surprise and we captured Bichevier. Elements of an infantry division enter the wrecked French town. The advance envelops the town of Oberhofen, a mile north of Bichevier and about four miles southeast of Agno. Prisoners are seized en route. Self-propelled 105 mm howitzer spearhead the attack.
itself is penetrated by infantry units also advancing behind the 105s. Three weeks after this action of 11th December, new Nazi counterattacks are reported against the 7th Army's positions west of the Wiesembourg Gap. <laughs> 